And then before we <coughs> actually begin, let's take a moment and generate our motivation <coughs> and think that we'll share it together this evening so that we can learn about a new country, a new culture, how different people on the planet live. And through that, may we open our mind and cultivate compassion for all living beings and then work in the world to be of as much benefit as we possibly can to living beings. So let's make our motivation for sharing the evening today one of compassion and care. And then open your eyes. So pausing to generate our motivation is one thing that Buddhists do a lot because we say that our generation, our motivation is the most important element of what we do. It's not how we look or what other people think of us. It's what our intention is, why we're doing what we're doing. Because I think we all know how to look good to other people, but having a good motivation, one of kindness and so on, we aren't so used to looking inward and really checking why we're doing what we're doing. We're mostly interested in impressing people and, you know, outward directed activities. Buddhism is very much an inward one. Um, the idea being that as we improve ourselves, then the benefit we can give to others improves. But when our own heart and mind are uncontrolled and we're filled with greed and anger and jealousy and arrogance, then uh, even though one part of us may mean well, uh, we wind up doing a lot of things that cause damage to both ourselves and others. So that's why it's always looking inside. So that's why we started the way we did. Then um, tonight I'm going to talk about Tibet and uh, a little bit about Buddhism and weave in and out of those. As you know, Tibet is on the other side of the Himalayas from Nepal. It's um, the capital, Lhasa, is at 12,000 feet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the country, it was uh, an independent country, and then it was, uh, oh, you know, occupied by the communist Chinese. And in 1959, there was an abortive uprising, and tens of thousands of Tibetans fled from the highest place in the world down to the plains of India. Uh, and they reestablished their monasteries and communities as refugees in India and somewhat in, in Nepal as well. Okay, and that's the situation of the country right, right now. It's still under uh, Chinese occupation. So, we put together this slideshow. We'll, we'll see how it goes, okay? So, can you, yeah, it's coming up. Okay, so this is the, uh, the, the statue of the Buddha. This is the main statue of the Buddha in the temple in Bodh Gaya, which was, Bodh Gaya is where he attained full awakening. So, of course, you know, Buddhism started with the Buddha, but like all genuine religious leaders, he had no idea of starting a religion or, or anything like that. People who are really spiritual, they don't care about 
their reputation. They don't care about institutions and things like that. They're just teaching what they know from their own experience. And so it was with the Buddha. So he lived uh, five, about five centuries BCE, okay, in northern India. That's the stupa. The stupa is like a monument, um, you know, to a great being. Yeah. And then after he attained full awakening, full awakening means a state of mind in which the mental afflictions and uh, the wrong views and wrong attitudes and disturbing emotions have all been eradicated such that they can't uh, arise again and where all good qualities have been generated. So it takes a lot of internal work to do this. It's a slow process, but a very worthwhile one. So the Buddha attained full awakening in Bodh Gaya then he walked uh, to Sarnath, which is outside Varanasi, and he gave his first teaching to his first five disciples. Okay, and then Buddhism began to spread from northern India. Uh, it went south to Sri Lanka and was established there. It went uh, east or west into Afghanistan and Iran. It went north into uh, Tibet. It went uh, west, no, east, <laughs> into uh, China, from China. It also went to Tibet. It went to Korea, um, uh, Mongolia, Japan. And then it also went into Southeast Asia yeah, uh, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, and so forth, and even down into Indonesia. And then in recent years, it's come to Western countries, and it's been a fast-growing religion in Western countries, but not so pa fast that everybody's becoming Buddhist, not like that, <laughs> but quite popular. Okay. The Buddha's teachings, we have three extant canons, you know, the accumulation of the texts. One is in Pali, uh, an ancient language, and that is used uh, in the Theravada Buddhist tradition. We have the, the Chinese canon in Chinese language, and then the Tibetan canon in Tibetan. And now there is an effort to translate the scriptures into English as well. And within the scriptures, we have uh, what they call three baskets. So one is about ethical conduct, and it focuses on the monastic um, discipline. The second one is the sutra basket, and that teaches a lot about concentration. And then the third is the Abhidharma, which emphasizes wisdom. Oh, we don't have those titles in there. Anyway, those were the three. Okay, so then there's four truths for the Aryas. These are the basic teachings that the Buddha taught. Aryas are beings who have realized the nature of reality directly, yeah? With, uh, with their own mental consciousness, their own mind, yeah? And so these four things have, uh, are uh, uh, true for those who that have that kind of wisdom. So the first one, it says true suffering. Suffering is a rotten translation. We have to change that, okay? What it means is um, unsatisfactory situations, yeah? So I think we can agree that there's a lot of unsatisfactory things in our life. I mean, we get born and get sick and old and die and none of it's by choice. That's kind of unsatisfactory, you know? 
and then we can't always get what we want problems we don't want come naturally we get what we want but we're sometimes disappointed and disillusioned yeah so the whole idea is uh, you know there's something our life is good but there's something unsatisfactory about it okay I wouldn't say that aging sickness and death are our favorite things to look forward to yeah would you so though that's the one that says true sufferings the true causes is what is the origin of this situation that we're in uh, this situation where we take one rebirth after another rebirth under the influence of ignorance yeah so the the true causes we would say primary one is ignorance yeah and then craving anger yeah those three are often called the the three big ones the three poisons we call them because when they're manifest in our mind they really poison our mind they poison our relationships but the thing is that although things are not satisfactory now and they have these causes in terms of ignorance attachment and anger uh, this is not a done deal yeah there's a there's an antidote to it there's another choice and so that's what the true cessations are you know the cessation of all the confusion of all the stress of all the running around not knowing what in the world we're doing okay and being pushed here and there by uh, by forces that are out of our control so the true cessation is a state of mind where all of that uh, has been permanently overcome and then the true paths are uh, the states of mind that we cultivate the wisdom mind that helps us to overcome all of that mm -hmm. okay and the Eightfold Noble Path is one of the things that we practice so it begins with right view you know understanding what is life about what are the causes of our experience okay right intention having a mind of benevolence a mind that is uh, free of craving for gazillions of possessions a mind of uh, non-harmfulness or non-cruelty what uh, Gandhiji called ahimsa okay then right speech uh, so abandoning lying harsh words divisive words and idle talk could you imagine the news one day on the news with everybody using white right speech no lying no creating division among people no hurting people's feelings no gossip can you imagine be pretty different wouldn't it yeah so we try and practice right speech and then right uh, action so that refers primarily to uh, sustaining life abandoning killing protecting others possessions not stealing and then using sexuality wisely and kindly without uh, actions that could either spread uh, sexually transmitted diseases or hurt people in any way okay then we also practice um, right livelihood yeah so earning uh, your living in a way that is ethical you know where we earn our living without harming others without cheating them without uh, killing them yeah so trying to to do work that re really sustains life improves society improves <coughs> the the uh, mental and physical happiness of all living beings 
it's an important value. Then right mindfulness means um, paying attention to what we're doing and paying attention to what our values are and our principles and trying to live by them. So having a clear mind where we know, you know, what are my ethical principles? What am I willing to do and what am I not willing to do? What is something wholesome and virtuous? What is unwholesome and non-virtuous? Okay, and so being mindful of that, living according to that. And then uh, right concentration, which is uh, learning how to focus the mind, uh, concentrate the mind single-pointedly, so our mind isn't like all over the place with millions of thoughts and distractions and well you know how our minds are <laughs> yeah and then right effort so that is a a feeling of enthusiasm for what is beneficial and that supports all the different activities okay then we also do the three principal aspects of the path renunciation Renunciation means renouncing suffering. Lots of people hear renunciation. They think, oh, it means you're going to go live in a, in a cave and eat nettles, you know. No, it doesn't mean renouncing happiness. It means renouncing suffering. Okay, being fed up with um, the way that our, so much in our life is out of our control. Hmm? Bodhicitta is the mind of altruism, the mind that, that is motivated by uh, love and compassion for each and every loving being, living being, such that our motivation for everything we do in our life is to improve ourselves spiritually, gain wisdom, increase our compassion, gain skillful means, and so on, so that we can be of the greatest benefit to all of society and to all living beings, no matter who they are. And this is all based on equanimity, in other words, having equal respect for everybody. Yeah. So I think these kind of values are very important in this country, don't you? We seem to be losing touch with a lot of this. And uh, it's very important, you know, because as soon as we start looking at things in life as there's us and there's them, you know, and us, my side, more important, always better, I'm going to look out for my side, we're right, we're the winners, the others, they're different, they think different, they look different, they act different. I don't care about them. Yeah? So from a Buddhist perspective, that way of looking at other living beings as us and them, as some people more valuable than others, is completely off base. Yeah? As completely off base. Because if we look into the heart of each and every living being, what we find in each of our hearts, no matter how we look or what we come from or what we believe is we see somebody who wants happiness and doesn't want suffering yeah and everybody is completely equal there's not any difference amongst us in that way and so it's really important to remember that yeah and to see that when we really look at it there's no reason why my, me why I am more important than others, or why my side should be better than others or have more than others. Yeah, there's no reason for that at all. Yeah, and in fact, yeah, from a Buddhist viewpoint, when we just look out for ourselves and we, you know, I'm first, my side is first, ignore everybody else, then we actually create more causes for suffering. Because when we don't care about the happiness of the people who live around us, 
when those people aren't treated fairly, they become unhappy. Then we have to live with unhappy people. Yeah? Are you happy when you live and you're surrounded by people who are unhappy? No, you're more miserable. So the Dalai Lama always says, if you want to be selfish, be selfish in the proper way, and that means take care of everybody else. Care about other living beings. Because if we care about other living beings, we'll create a society that is more peaceful. And when we live in a society that is more peaceful, we're better off too, aren't we? Whereas if we just all about me, I, my, and mine, we do actions that really create a lot of mess. And we can see this if we open our eyes and look around. Yeah. Emptiness. It should be wisdom, not emptiness. Wisdom. No, what did you do on you made this? <laughs> I got to criticize the person who helps me, you know? Um, <laughs> she can take it, though. Uh, so it should be... <laughs> yeah, don't cry here, okay? Uh, <laughs> So, wisdom is, uh, you know, something that we really need, you know. We need to understand what is the nature of reality. We need to understand causality. What things cause happiness? What things cause suffering? Okay, so wisdom is, is that third one. Okay, then, okay, then in the Tibetan uh, monasteries, Okay, these are some of the topics that they study. This isn't in the order that they study them. But one is uh, wisdom or the Abhidharma teachings. Second is the perfection of wisdom called Prajnaparamita. The middle way talks about the nature of reality. The Sanskrit term is Madhyamaka. Logic and reasoning is called Pramana. Okay, the monastic precepts and ethical conduct in general is Vinaya, how to subdue the mind and the actions of body and speech. Then the, gradu uh, the graded stages of the path to awakening. So this is a series of meditations that we do uh, that help us develop our inner qualities and lead us to full awakening. And then the thought transformation teachings, which are a wonderful set of teachings that are all about how to transform adversity into our spiritual path. And I think that something that we could all use that's very useful, because we always have adversity. And so how, instead of what adversity strikes, being unhappy, being miserable, getting depressed, how to transform those situations so that they become a cause for our own spiritual awakening. So there's a whole genre of teachings like that in Tibetan Buddhism. Okay, Nalanda Monastery is in India. Yeah, it really flourished the 5th to the 12th centuries. And uh, this was the site of a lot of the great Buddhist learning. There were several monastic universities in India. Uh, Nalanda, uh, Vrakamasila, Odantapuri, Taksila. Many of these uh, where Buddhism really flourished. Uh, until the uh, the beginning of the 13th century, and then it was knocked out. Okay, so you can go to the ruins of Nalanda today. It's it's quite inspiring, and it's also quite sad, you know. Okay, then Buddhism going to Tibet, which we're going to talk about because I follow the Tibetan tradition. So. Um, it came into India th uh, first during the reign of the king Sangsangampo, 7th century, and he had uh, two wives. One was from China, one was from India, and they each brought a Buddhist statue and brought the first Buddhist scriptures 
to Tibet and that's how Buddhism came into Tibet. So it, it actually came into Tibet rather late when you think that it went to uh, Sri Lanka in the third, fourth century BC, went to China, started going there in the first century AD. So it was actually quite late by the time it got to Tibet, probably even later by the time it got to Korea and uh, Japan. Okay, King Chitsong Datsun was another Tibetan king that helped to spread the Dharma. And uh, the abbot Shantarakshita, he was a great scholar and a great meditator. He was Indian and he was the one who began the monastic ordination of monks and nuns. Well, actually he just began the ordination of monks in Tibet. And uh, they cro had to cross the Himalaya mountains. He came with a whole contingent of other Indian monks. And then they gave the ordination and began to teach the, uh, Buddhism in Tibet. And Guru Padmasambhava also came uh, a little around that time. And he uh, brought the tantric teachings a lot and really subdued a lot of the hindrances to uh, stabilizing Buddhism in Tibet. Okay, then Lama Atisha. Then we had, after all the, the uh, great leaders, then there was one king who was, you know, he was the bad guy in the whole thing. And he uh, basically, he was very much against Buddhism. So he led a religious persecution and base, almost completely destroyed Buddhism in Tibet. And uh, so the, the mm, you know, Sang Sangampa, Tritsang Dechen, Sankarashita, they were the, what we call the old tradition, the ones who initially brought Buddhism to Tibet. Then when the, the other king uh, destroyed most of it, then in uh, the 11th century, a second wave of great teachers began to come. And the first one there, one of the early ones was Lama Tisha. So he was also an abbot um, from Nalanda Monastery in India. And he's very well respected in, in uh, Tibet nowadays. A lot of the teachings come from, <coughs> from him. <coughs> Milarepa is one of the great Tibetan yogis. Um, he lived in a cave. He was the one who lived in the cave and ate nettles. Okay, but uh, that that's, doesn't mean we all have to do like that. But he attained full awakening in that very life. So he too is very revered for his um, incredible perseverance sincerity, you know, in practicing the path. Sakya Pandita, another great sage, yeah, who, uh, there were the five uh, Sakya great sages, he was one of them. Okay, and then Lama Tsongkhapa, who came later. So each of these were uh, some of the most well-respected um, practitioners in the different Buddhist uh, traditions, different schools that arose. And then uh, all this came down to uh, His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. Yeah, and he's still alive. May he live very long. He's um, quite an amazing person. If you ever have the chance to uh, attend a teaching or a public talk that he's giving, definitely go. Um, there's a lot of his talks that are on the web that you can listen to. Um, you know, there's a dalilama.com, there's a whole website that talks about His Holiness. He's really an amazing human being. He was born in 1935 
And uh, the Tibetans have this tradition of uh, looking for the incarnations of very great spiritual leaders. And so the 13th Dalai Lama had passed away a few years be before. He was born, um, and he was born in a peasant family in eastern Tibet. And what they did when they were looking for the incarnations of the great masters, they would send out search parties. But the search parties wouldn't say, well, we're looking for the Dalai Lama, or we're looking for the incarnation of a great sage, because then everybody would run up with their kids and say, it's my kid, it's my kid. So they went incognito. So the search party that was looking for the Dalai Lama, they were, went to eastern Tibet, and uh, there were no hotels. So you, whenever you wanted to stop somewhere, you stopped at somebody's home, and they usually you know, welcomed you, and you could stay there. Uh, when I went to Tibet in, in, when did I go, 1987, that's the way we traveled around too. Uh, you know, when we were out in the countryside, you just stop somewhere and ask somebody if you can stay in their home and they welcome you. It's quite wonderful. Anyway, so the search party it was disguised as a merchant, a mer group of merchants. And there was one Tibetan uh, there were a few Tibetan teachers in the party, but one of them in particular uh, was disguised as the, the one who took care of the animals, okay? The idea being that when you stayed, when you were welcomed into somebody's home, the, uh, this was a merchant party, disguised merchant party, the merchants would go in the like the living room where the adults were the nice room and the people who handled the animals would go in the kitchen but the children were also in the kitchen and so they were looking for the child who was the incarnation of the Dalai Lama so you know this one uh, Lama this one Tibetan teacher was you know dressed up like the ones handling the, the animals. He was in the kitchen with, you know, the, the cooks and the children. And this little boy, who was, I think he was like three or four at the time, run, comes and sits in his lap. And, uh, you know, the, the teacher, disguised teacher, was wearing the prayer beads of the previous Dalai Lama. And the little child pulled at the prayer beads and said, these are mine. And somebody else in the party said, well, we'll give them to you if you can tell us who this is. And he called out the name of who that, that man was. He recognized him from his previous life. So there were a lot of things like this where this child, <coughs> he knew how to speak uh, the dialect of Tibetan from central Tibet, even though he lived in Amdo, where the dialect was completely different. There were all these kinds of signs whereby, you know, they were able to recognize that this child is the incarnation of the previous Dalai Lama. So uh, he was brought to central Tibet and then enthroned and then he grew up there. When he was 15, in 1950, there was a lot of political pressure in, from the uh, communist government in China. <coughs> and because people had so much reverence for the Dalai Lama, uh, they asked him to take charge of the government. Okay. Now imagine yourself at age 15. Okay. What would it be like for you to take charge of a government in a country? <laughs> Pretty scary, huh? None of us had that ability. But he was put in that position and he had to rise to the occasion. And then nine years later, um, there was an abortive uprising 
against the communist Chinese and tens of thousands of Tibetans fled into India and so His Holiness had to flee. I think uh, there might be a picture further on when, uh, when he's fleeing he had to again disguise himself and uh, go over the Himalaya mountains in March when it's really cold okay and then start everything afresh in India Nehru was Prime Minister of India at that time and he was so incredibly kind and gave land and <coughs> so forth to the Tibetan refugees even though India was very impoverished at that time okay here's the Dalai Lama when he was a child now we have the next set of pictures okay which were all taken in around in the early 1940s <coughs> and the w they were taken by a man who uh, was a reporter for I think it was the Chicago Tribune some paper in in Chicago and uh, he was one of the only people that was allowed in Tibet at that time. They didn't want let other foreigners into Tibet. But he took the photographs, came back out. His niece lives in Coeur d'Alene. And so when she heard that we were setting up a monastery, she came and then she gave us all these, you know, the, the um, files with the pictures that her uncle had taken in the 40s in old Tibet. So these are very precious pictures. Okay, so Dalai Lama, he must have been, I don't know, maybe seven, eight years old at that time. This is the Batala Palace where he lived up on the hill in the center of Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. Now, the, you know, this was in the 40s. Now it is completely, you know, filled all everywhere with buildings and houses and everything going on. You know, you could see here it was empty at the bottom of the hill, but no way now. Okay, here is a man uh, bowing or prostrating. The Tibetans had incredible devotion to the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And they would very often bow uh, all the way to get to the main central tem temple in Tibet. So it was usually, uh, they would um, bow the full length of their body. You can see how he's going down. And then when they stood up, then they would walk to where their head was and bow again. And in that way, keep progressing until they got to the central temple called the Jokong in Tibet. So that's what that man's doing. Okay, here's some Tibetan women in Lhasa. And uh, the dress is still very common. They don't do, sometimes you'll, you'll see very special occasions. The women will do the, the kind of headdress that I think one of them you can see. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the, the clothes are basically the same. Now in India, made out of cotton and polyester. Here they were often made of much warmer material, usually uh, wool from the yaks. Okay, there's a yak. <laughs> These were the Tibetan. Uh, they kept the Tibetans going. They were used for transportation. You would make... Um, butter and cheese from the yak milk uh, these were you know all over Tibet and uh, kept the Tibetans alive <coughs> okay there's a yak caravan so Tibet remember this is the 1940s <coughs> no roads <coughs> somebody brought a car gave the Dalai Lama a car 
I've always wondered how they got the car into Tibet because there's no roads over the Himalayas. Coming in from China was very far. So I don't know how, th maybe they, they might have just taken all the parts in and then assembled the car. It was a gift from somebody in the West. You know, of course there were no asphalt roads to ride on, never mind. Okay, so, you know, they often just traveled by caravans of yaks. Okay, they, and when they crossed the rivers, the, um, the boats, there's some, what do you call them, coracles, something like that. Yeah, they were made of yak skin. Oop. Oh, wait a minute. I'm trying to go backwards. Where did I go? Okay, so here's a Tibetan monk. He's on pilgrimage. So many of the Tibetans, you know, who live scattered all over to Tibet, they would either walk or bow from their village all the way to the central temple in Lhasa. So here's one monk who's doing that. Drepung Monastery. There was one of the largest monasteries in Tibet. It had 10,000 monks. Yeah, quite large. It was outside the, the capital city of Lhasa. Okay, so here was the Chinese invasion in 1950. They came in from the eastern part of Tibet and then gradually into central Tibet. At one point, His Holiness uh, and the Pension Lama went to Beijing and met Chairman Mao. So this picture is quite old. You can see His Holiness is wearing brocade. He's not wearing monk's robes there. You know, in, a, in the old times, they had so much respect for him, they didn't want him, they wanted him to wear brocade. But His Holiness, once he left Tibet, he changed back into monk's robes. <coughs> like, like this. We all wear the same clothes. So he, there, I think this was maybe around 55, so he's probably about 20 years old, meeting with Chairman Mao. Okay, then in 1959, there was the uprising. The context of the uprising, there was, you know, increasing tension in Tibet. And then at one point, the Chinese military was having a theater presentation, and they invited the Dalai Lama to come alone. Okay, now what do you think inviting the leader of a country to go alone <coughs> to a, a military camp of the occupiers? Does that spell uh, something auspicious and good? Hardly. So what happened is that's when they decided to leave. And uh, His Holiness left, you know, he was maybe a day or two out before the rest of the population knew. <coughs> My own teachers uh, were, were all refugees from Tibet. And one of my teachers tells the story. He was at Sarah Monastery, one of the large monasteries that had 5,500 monks near Lhasa, smaller than, the, than Drepung. And he said, you know, when all this trouble, you know, kind of came to a head in Lhasa, that they just took their tea bowls because any t good Tibetan monk, you always have your tea bowl with you. You know, <laughs> so they took their teacups, went into the mountains. They thought, okay, we'll be there for a couple of days. And because you can see the mountains in the background there. We'll be there for a couple of days. Things will settle down. We'll come back. We'll resume our studies at the monastery. 
Well, that's not what happened because once they heard that His Holiness fled, then they realized the gravity of the situation. And so you had tens of thousands of Tibetans uh, <coughs> fleeing Tibet over the Himalayas. It was a very dangerous journey. The Chinese troops would chase them and shoot at them. They went from the highest place in the world down to the Indian plains. You know, very few bacteria and virus in uh, Tibet, lots in India. So many of the Tibetan refugees died from illnesses contracted in India. Um, the monks, the first place they were sent to, to establish their monastery was an old British POW camp. Some of you may have seen the movie Seven Years in Tibet, and you may have remembered, you know, he was captured and um, imprisoned. That's the camp where the monks were, okay? So they started out there and then, you know, slowly uh, spread across North India, making different Tibetan settlements. But my, in the, my case, my teachers were all from this initial group of people who fled and lived in Baksa, the concentration camp. Okay, his, there's His Holiness in the center. Okay, you can see, dressed up. And this was when they were escaping in 1959. Okay, so they didn't have much time to talk, to plan and to pack. Yeah, His Holiness tells the story he just grabbed a few of the texts that were most precious to him. Then they got on the back of a yak and off they went, you know, over the mountains to India. Okay, then, now they're in India. Y so you have a whole group of people who speak Tibetan who don't know Hindi or anything about Indian customs and so on, establishing their life. So my first two teachers were Lama Yeshe on the left and uh, Lama Zopa on the right. And uh, they, they came and it was very, they were refugees and there was a Russian American princess of some sort uh, who met them and was interested in the Buddha's teachings, the Dharma, and requested them to teach Westerners. So they began to teach Westerners. Both of them spoke some English. It was interesting English, and you trained your ear to, to hear it, you know, uh, because they Basically, there weren't, uh, you know, these nice, neat English as a second language classes, okay? There was, uh, you know, listening to the people around you and picking up what you could. And there was one, I think, dictionary. You so you look up some words in the dictionary. Okay. But these were my first two teachers and are my teachers. Okay, and they started um, giving courses on, on Buddhism, on the Dharma. The first one was in 1971, and they uh, had relocated outside of Kathmandu in a, uh, outside of a small town uh, called Bodhanath on a hill that was called Kopan. And they started having these uh, meditation classes for Westerners. And they were like, it would be like a one month program and you went there. So it was all the hippies who had been, you know, gone to, uh, to Nepal. And I won't tell you everything they did on the way over there. Um, some of you may have parents or maybe even grandparents from that generation. Uh, you can ask them. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, so they started teaching the courses. And, uh, okay. And so gradually, the, you know, some of the people who came wanted to ordain. I first encountered the Buddhist teachings, um, went to my first course in California 
the Lama Yeshin Lama Zopa had been invited there uh, to give a course at Lake Arrowhead, so I went. And then after that, I quit my job. I was a teacher and uh, was in the middle of graduate school, and I went to their monastery in Nepal. So there's me in the picture somewhere. Okay. Then uh, this is from in 1987. Yeah, I went on pilgrimage to Tibet. This photo was taken. There's a lake called Lamo Lhotso. In, and when they looked, we were looking for the incarnations of the Dalai Lama. They would go and stand. Uh, this is on the the lake is down, and then you know the mountains come up, and so they would sit high up and look down, and they could ha would see visions of letters or homes or whatever that would give the indication of where the Dalai Lama was. So this is where we, we went to. We got there on horseback. Okay, this was a Tibetan village. One of my teachers, uh, he, um, you know, uh, gave me something to take to his family in Tibet, and so we went to one village. They didn't know we were coming. We just kind of arrived. They were quite excited. Um, these are. This was a puja, an offering ceremony, a guided meditation uh, with some of my teachers. This was in Dharamsala. Okay, this is um, with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And then, well, all this stuff about me. Um, then this is the full ordination in Taiwan. I went there. Okay, and then we had a conference in 1996 called Life as a Western Buddhist Nun and uh, with teachers from both the Chinese Buddhist tradition and Tibetan tradition. And then afterwards we had an audience with His Holiness here. And then uh, we established the Abbey. So these are some pictures. This is a picture from our very first ordination at the Abbey. Okay, uh, this is with our architect. We had to build some new buildings when the property, we got a large piece of property, but we needed more buildings when the community started to grow. So our architect is in Coeur Lane, excellent architect. This is when we were agreeing to, um, to build one of the new buildings. And because uh, when you undertake a building project, it is a lot of work. And uh, so we all had to make, we had to make sure everybody in the community was on board and wanted to do this. So that's what we were doing there. Then every um, year, the Western Buddhist monastics or Asian uh, monastics who live in the West, we have a gathering. This one was at the Abbey, and it's very wonderful because we're all from different Buddhist traditions, but we come and we talk, we learn about each other's traditions and practices, and then we also practice together. And that's it. Okay, so um, we can do a few minutes of Q&A or at least the Q part. I don't. I won't guarantee answers. Uh, you talked a little bit about the reincarnation uh -huh. of the Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. um, so, is that kind of a universal type of reincarnation belief? As in, uh, you believe that there are like. I guess every person is reincarnated, mm -hmm. or is it solely just the Dalai Lama? No, we would say everybody. Um, you know, takes another rebirth, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, until you get to the point <clears throat> where you've eliminated ignorance and then you can stop the cycle of, of rebirth, or if you also have compassion 
uh, at that point you can choose your rebirth so that you can be born somewhere where you can be of great benefit. But we say everybody gets reborn. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I ask one more? Sure. Uh, what would be like a good text, I guess, to read up a little more on this? Just on Buddhism in general? Um, or on... Uh, I would s lean more towards like the... Maybe enunciation a little more on like the whole... I don't know, like the beliefs of it, like uh, oh, okay. you know, implications of it. Well, then I would say um, Open Heart, Clear Mind, yeah, is a good book. There's a whole chapter there about, re about rebirth and also about karma that, you know, talks a lot about how mm -hmm. the, the rebirth, what factors influence what thing we're reborn as. Okay. And it also is a, it's a good uh, over, overview. Open heart, clear mind. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Is it there? Yeah. Oh, we have it. Okay. Good. As you were going over the uh, many of the historical figures, mm -hmm. I noticed that in their names they seem to have mm, d different titles. It, mm. Is that what they would be considered? Like Lama, Guru? Is it a something about where they are in their path or? Yeah, well, guru or lama basically means, uh, it refers to a spiritual teacher, okay? Uh, how one becomes a spiritual teacher is basically because other people request you to give teachings, okay? Then the Tibetans are full of titles, yeah? Um, <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, you know, and some are educational degrees, some indicate somebody who's uh, recognized from a previous life. Um, there's all sorts of things like that. But the Dalai Lama always encourages us to look at somebody's qualities, not their titles. I just had a quick question. Um, the picture with all the, a view and all the monastics in the Kopan and the uh -huh. Western monastic, of that group, how many are still ordained? Oh, I would have to look at the at the picture again. Um, I don't know, maybe a third or a half. I'm not sure. I'd have to look at the picture and remember the people. Yeah. When we take our ordination, we take it with the intention to keep it for life, but then there's some people hit bumps in the middle of the road afterwards, and so if you have hit a bump and you, you know, want to give up being a monastic, there's a way to do it. Yeah, it's, it's quite difficult for Western monastics, especially that first generation, there were no monasteries, there was no financial support. We were in Nepal, uh, and every once in a while the government would change their policy and kick us all out, and then we'd have to go and get new visas to come back, if we could get a new visa. And then we'd stay in India, and then the Indian government would say, oh, you've been here too long, you've got to leave, and then you would get dysentery, or hepatitis. Um, in those days, it was, it was quite interesting. <laughs> Put it that way. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons, actually, why I wanted to start the Abbey, because then, you know, Westerners who wanted to, to live that kind of lifestyle would have a place where they, you know, could live and they could be supported and have what they need. Um, at what point in your life did you become interested in Buddhism or following the Dharma? Um, it was, at what point? I was searching for a long time. I wanted to understand the meaning of life and none of the other religions I looked at made much sense to me. So I happened, uh, I actually was in India and Nepal in 1973. I saw Buddhist artwork, I was attracted to it, but I didn't know what it meant. 
And it wasn't until I was back in the U.S. in 1975 that uh, I saw a flyer at a bookstore for this meditation course and I went and then that was it. Yeah. Your life uh, often turns out in ways that you don't anticipate. Yeah. Um, you think your life's going to go one way and then things happen and your life becomes very different than what you thought it was going to be. And certainly very different than what your parents expected. Yeah. My parents had a few words about that. <laughs> okay. Do you add something? Thank you. I'm always interested to hear about the ways in which religious and philosophical traditions overlap. And given your experience growing up in the West, mm -hmm. what philosophical or religious concepts that you encountered in the rationalist tradition or in the Christian tradition would you say um, align with some principles of Buddhism, whether they're from the Eightfold Path or not, um, that may have made your entry into Buddhism, um, may, may not paved the way, but made it seem a little more familiar? Yeah. Okay, I would say, uh, first of all, emphasis on ethical conduct, you know? Um, I think all major religions teach some kind of ethical conduct um, that revolves around not killing, not stealing, you know, not having unwise or, or uh, you know, uh, unwise or uncompassionate sexual relationships, lying, all those kinds of things. So, um, you know, that I learned in the religion I grew up in. You find the same thing in Buddhism. I think most religions also talk about love and compassion for other living beings. They talk about forgiveness. Yeah, they talk about cherishing uh, others and treating them fairly, not cheating them and so forth. So um, this also is, is, quite em is emphasized quite strongly in Buddhism, but I certainly uh, had the introduction when I was a kid. Yeah. The deeper philosophy in Buddhism about the nature of reality is ex very, very different than uh, theistic religions. Yeah, that philosophy, there's not much in common. Okay. But I think that may be what really attracted me to Buddhism because I couldn't make much sense of the theistic religions. Yeah, but the Buddhist uh, view about the nature of reality, I found, uh, you know, it was based on reasoning and that really appealed to me. Anything else? Okay, then we'll close the evening. Thank you all for coming. You're all very welcome to come visit Shravasti Abbey. It's not that far away, and some of you have already come to visit, so the rest of you are welcome to come join us. Yeah, um, yeah it's quite a nice community. That, that we live in, and I think it's um, one thing that I really value in America is the diversity of people, diversity of religions, of languages, of customs, and everything. And so I think, especially those of you in university right now, this is a time in your life when you don't have a lot of responsibility. Um, you know, you don't have kids and loans and well, maybe you have loans, but I hopefully not too many, um, you know. But where you can really explore things that are, uh, that are different than the world you grew up in. And I think that's so valuable to be able to really stretch your horizons, stretch your boundaries, uh, talk to the kind of people that you never have talked to before. Talk to people who think different than, than you do, who grow up in in situations different than the ones that you grew up in. 
Um, I think this is something really beautiful that the U.S. has, is this, this big diversity. Yeah, so take advantage of it when you're young and, um, and explore religions and cultures and everything, yeah? So. Good, thank you.